<laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite TV shows, it's a guilty pleasure, uh, is The Office. I, I love watching The Office. In fact, if you watch it, don't watch it because I told you it was good because there's a lot of it. It's not good. But I, I love watching it. I love watching dumb things at night when I've had a, a long day and I've, I've dealt with different things and different people and different situations, all the things that we do, our kids, our families, all stuff. I love to watch something dumb. Uh, because I don't have to think about it. I can't do drama at night. I can't do cop shows at night. I can't do any of that. It just gets me more worked up. And so I need something dumb. So The Office is one of those guilty pleasures for me. And if you don't watch Office, it's basically a whole TV show shot inside of a paper company. They sell paper. And at the, at the peak, there's two main characters, Jim, who is the cool office guy, and Dwight, who's the exact opposite of all of that, all right? Jim gets the girl, Dwight has a beet farm. Uh, you know, that's, and that's literally how it works. Uh, and so one episode, one of my favorite episode openers, Jim comes in one day dressed up like Dwight. They're like enemies, they're, they're office enemies, and Dwight is very nerdy. He always wears mustard yellow shirts with like mustard, like poop, kid poop, baby poop colored ties. I mean, he has no sense of fashion. He has these big glasses, and then he parts his hair right down the middle, and he's this very nerdy guy. Well, one day Jim shows up to the office dressed exactly like Jim or exactly like Dwight, excuse me. He sits down and he starts having a conversation. He ends up saying some stuff that makes Dwight upset. Bear beats Battlestar Galacta. God, if you watch it, you know what I'm talking about. And then at that moment, Dwight starts to notice Jim looks different today. And then Jim opens up a briefcase, like throws it on his desk, just like Dwight has. And he pulls out a bobblehead doll and slams it on the desk, which Dwight also has. Then all of a sudden, Dwight's like, He's trying to look like me. He's imitating me. He, he's copying me. And this is one of my favorite lines in the whole movie. And this is what Dwight says. It's a little picture from this moment. He says, identity theft is not a joke, Jim. Millions of families suffer every year. He's like talking about like it's a disease or something. Uh, but he gets so mad. He yells Michael. Jim yells Michael. And the scene ends basically. But I, I love this because uh, it, it's just funny. Identity theft really doesn't have anything to do with dressing like someone else. It has more to do with like stealing your credit cards, right? Uh, stealing your identity. Someone gets into your mailbox, opens up a credit card in your name, maxes it. That's identity theft, right? Someone, someone empties out your bank account, steals a check. That's identity theft. But for whatever reason, Dwight thought if you dress like somebody, you're stealing their identity. It's one of my favorite scenes. <clears throat> and reminded me also of this commercial. It, I think it came out in the Super Bowl uh, in the early 2000s. And there was this company, and it's still around, called LifeLock. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. The CEO got out there, and he was doing this commercial, and he was talking about it. And he was saying, you need to protect your identity. And what we offer, the products, the services that we offer are so good, I'm going to stand in front of a box truck with my social security number behind me. Anyone remember that commercial? He like posted his social security number. He's like, this is how good our product is. I'm going to share my social security number with the entire world. It doesn't matter because our stuff will protect you. What they didn't report is that in the next two years, his identity got stolen 13 times and he actually had to go get a new social security number. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, so we think about identity theft and uh, these things. We think about like those kind of things, right? Money, our jobs, uh, things like that, uh, our, our bank accounts, our credit cards. But I, I want to look at today, and we're going to look at some scripture today, and even I'm going to share part of my own personal testimony, that I think that in our own lives, there's a sense of identity theft, that there's a real enemy coming to break our identity, steal our identity, corrupt, perverse our identity, and it's put a lot of us in this room and in our world in an identity crisis. Um, and, and, and when we talk about it, I'm not talking about your, your pocket and your money. I'm talking more about like what's right here. Like how, how you feel that you are. Who are you? Who, who, what are you? What do, how do people know me? Like what is my identity? That's what we're going to be talking about today. I remember when I was uh, eight, nine years old. Um, I was playing Little League Baseball. My dad was a coach. I was on a church league baseball team. And I remember when I was playing, like I played, and I, I think I played second base, if I remember right, some, and some center field and some left field some. And, and, and like I, I contributed to the team, and I, I remember playing. I remember us being pretty good. But I also remember we had a thing called the all-star team. And the all-star team is where they would take one kid, they'd take the whole league, that whole age division, they'd take one or two kids from each team, and they'd build one super team, uh, kind of like what LeBron James has been doing the last 20 years. And, and they would build these super teams to then go play against other super teams in the state. 
and this was kind of before travel ball. It was like a state tournament, and that's what you would have, and the year was over. And, and so I remember as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, knowing like I was never going to be on that team. Like, not because someone told me. No one was me. My dad was a coach. He wasn't like, John, you kind of suck at baseball. <laughs> it was not the case. No one was mean. No one told me I wasn't good enough. I just knew that wasn't me. I'm not that guy. There's some guys that are that guy, and I could see him. I'm friends with them. I could see, I mean, that, that dude's a stud. But this is my role. This is what I do. And then I move into to junior high or, you know, middle school, we call it now. And I was eighth grade. And I remember trying out for the, the varsity team. And the varsity team was mostly ninth graders, but a few eighth graders would make it. And even though I tried out, I kind of knew I, I'm not going to make that team. I'm not that guy. Uh, now, the next year I made it because I grew six inches over summer. And you guaranteed get to be on the ninth, it's a varsity team if you're 6'4 in ninth grade, okay? That's the key. If you're wondering, how do I get my kids to start? Just help them grow, okay? Um, you can't coach that. Um, <laughs> And so, but I, I, but I remember like sitting there as an eighth grader going and trying out, like doing my best, but knowing I'm not that guy. That's not who I am. And then I remember as I get into high school, like the popularity thing becomes a thing and like what you drive and what you, how you dress. And when I was in high school, it was the plaid shirts, unbuttoned, the cargo pants and Doc Martens, okay? Anyone else remember that? The 90s, the green day, like the, the plaid shirts over black band shirts. And that was my era of high school and it's kind of coming back in some ways. Um, and, and, um, and so I remember all of that and like I remember like other guys were popular and they like dated girls girls and they were like going to things. And I remember like, uh, that's not me. Like I got my, my dude friends and there's some pretty girls, but I'm not really talking to them. And if I do, it doesn't really work out. It's not me. That's not who I am. And then I, I remember in high school, I went to a church camp and, and pastor preached a powerful message. The altars were full. And I remember coming down to the altar and kneeling down. And I was on like this side of the stage. I can remember if, if I went to that room and I could, I know where the building is. I know the room. I could show you exactly where I got on my knees and I was crying before the Lord, and I remember the first time I really heard God speak, and God called me into ministry. He said, John, you're going you're gonna to minister, you're going to be in pastoring, and I was like, okay, um, I don't know what that means, but okay. And I remember I heard that from God, and so I came back, I didn't know what to do with it, and I told one of my youth pastors, I said, hey, this is what I feel like God's doing in my life. And I was like 19 years old, because like, there's something I can do, what's my next step? And I remember he said, John, I, I, I really don't see that in you, you're not that guy, in more or less words. Uh, he, that's, it was a longer conversation, but more or less, he said, you're not that guy. And he offered me to be on the church youth group security team because I was 19 and you're 19, you shouldn't still be hanging out with youth people. And I, I'm still, uh, I hear that either be a leader or get out. And so, and so he was like, why don't you be on a security team? I was like, but I feel called to ministry. Can I intern? Can I lead a small group? Is there something I didn't want to preach? I just, is there something I can do to prepare myself? And he's just, you're not that guy. And something about that moment in my life, I, something switched where I, I quit receiving the fact that I'm not that guy. Something inside of me got a little agitated, uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, aggressive. And I remember going from I'm not that guy to turning into that I'm going to show you I can be. And, and something inside of me and my identity shifted and I became what I would call a striver. I, I'm going to overwork and I'm going to overachieve. And when everyone else works, they're eight to five and they go home, I'm staying and I'm going to work harder. I'm going to work longer. I might not be better. I might not be smarter. I might can't jump as high. I can't, might can't run as fast, but I'm going to work harder than everyone else. And I'm going to prove that I am worthy of being in that seat. I am that guy. And I remember something inside of me shifted and I started working. In fact, honestly, today, I still kind of struggle with that. Like I can tend to be a little bit of an overworker and an overachiever. And, and for me, it's easily personally, it's easier for me to believe that I'm useful than it is for me to believe that I'm wanted or loved. It's easier to believe that I have a function that I can serve in somebody's life more than they just want to hang out with me. And it's something part of my identity. And my identity has been for a long time and is that I'm a striver forever trying to prove that I'm lovable. That, that I'm worthy of, of people, not just in sports, not just in career, not just in pastoring even, but even in my relationship with Jesus. Like I kind of approach Jesus with a striving mentality. The fact that Jesus would give his life for me on the cross uh, based on nothing that I have done or nothing that I will do for him really bothers me, if I'm being honest. 
Like the fact that he would give his life for me, I'm like, yeah, but what else can I do? Or is there something, I, is there another level of it I can unpack? That? There's this part of me that wrestles with that. I want to prove that I'm worthy of God's love. I want to prove that I'm worthy of Christ's sacrifice. I want to prove that I'm worthy of him pausing in the heavens to listen to my prayers. I want to prove that I'm worthy of this calling to stand here today and preach God's word. I want to prove that I'm worthy of my wife and my kids' opportunity to lead my family. I want to prove that I'm worthy that you would show up and attend this church that you would trust us enough to sow in financially and be generous and tithe here. I want to prove that I'm worthy enough that you would show up and serve on a team and, and, and help us make a difference here. I, I live in a constant sense of striving. That's my identity. And, and that's how, and it, it may not be your identity, but I'm just confessing. Today, this is part of my testimony. I got the mic. I'm sharing my testimony, okay? But that's kind of how I'm wired. Like, I, I want to earn it. And, and to rest in Christ's love is counter to my identity when it feels like I have to work to receive everything I have. And, and, and so our identity is shaped by our experiences. I told you I played on the Little League baseball team. It was, I don't have any negative memories of that. I'm not sharing, like, no one yelled at me and told me I was not good. No kids made fun of me. Our experiences are not always bad that shape a poor identity. They can be good things that are just a little bit misappropriated or not quite understood or not quite solidified in the right things. And, but then we can also have bad things in our past. We can have voices or people that do say things or do do things that wreck our identity, that wreck who we are, that wreck our confidence and wreck our calling and our purpose in our life. And so our identity is simply this. Here's a, a simple definition. Our identity is what gives us, what gives you a sense of value or worth. For me, it's striving. When I strive, when I work hard, when I work harder than others, sometimes that's the merit. That's the goal. It's not that I'm better. I just know I worked harder. You might be better, but I worked harder. And so what is, what's the thing? What's your identity? What's the thing that you would say, this makes me feel valuable? This makes me feel like I have worth? And in fact, we can actually trace our identities all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and through 3. And I, I want to pause right here because I, I want you to kind of catch what, what's been going on in our church. For the last five weeks, we've been going back to Genesis. I, I, I preached a message early on in this series called, uh, I talked about our family of origin and how we're all from a, we have a, all have an origin story and many of us have an origin story and our family has brokenness and there's generational things and we talked about in Genesis how from the very beginning sin has been part of our story. And then the next week, Pastor Ryan got up here and he started in Genesis and he talked about relationships where God said in the garden, it's not good that man should be alone. And he created a wife and that we should be in communi communion with each other. God built us for relationships and when we launched small groups and hopefully a lot of you are in them. And then the next week, my friend Pastor Warren got up here and he preached the message from Genesis chapter one through three about how they were, it says that they were in the garden, Adam and Eve, and they were naked and unashamed, but then they sinned and they were naked and they hid themselves. So they were unashamed to shamed and, and how that's part of many of our identity. Like we, we, we have things that we're shameful of. And so we hide from God. We separate ourselves from God. And then the last week, Pastor Willie preached about the law of authority and the law of the seed from Genesis chapter one through three. Why do I pause to say that? I think God and the Holy Spirit are doing, is doing something in our church. Yeah. We did not talk about this. I did not send everyone preach from Genesis one chapter one through three. But I think God is bringing us back to the beginning of something so we can see what we're a part of and maybe so that we can be different. And sometimes to do something new, to go forward, you got to go backwards. And in fact, there's a biblical uh, studying uh, theological perspective on this. And I want to show you this. It's called the law of the first mention. So if you're ever studying the Bible and you've, you come upon a truth or a doctrine, you want to go, okay, am I understanding this correct? Is this really what God's Word says? The way that you prove that and the way that you show that is you go all the way back and you find the very first time it's mentioned. And then what you'll find is, and Pastor Willie did a beautiful job of this with the law of the seed and how he went from Genesis all the way really to Revelation and showed this seed law that God had put in. He brought us back to the law of first mention. Ryan did this with relationships. Shane, or my friend uh, Lauren did this with shame and how that's been part of our story for a long time. And today I want to show you what this really means. It, the law first mentioned is to understand a particular word or doctrine, we must first find the first place in Scripture that word or doctrine is revealed and study that passage. This is what the Holy Spirit's having us do. 
he's had us stay right there. He wants us to show, he wants to show us something. And, and today I'm kind of going to conclude this, this moment in this, this season, in these, these chapters here. But I think the Holy Spirit, if you haven't watched these other sermons, I encourage you to go back. I think he's trying to give us a full picture of something here in this series of I'm Not Okay. And so I want to take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. We're talking about our identity, right? Well, who are we? What is our identity? This is what God said. Let us make man and our image and after our likeness. So you want to know your identity? The very first mention of who we are, of how we are made, of what we are created after is right here. God spoke it with clarity and with confidence. And our identity was depicted right here in Genesis chapter 1. And it's clear. God said, let us make man in our image. You have identity. Your identity was given to you before you were born. As a human, as a creation, as someone that God made, God knew you would be here today. And at the beginning, the onset of humanity, he goes, I need to clearly define what their identity is. I need to make sure that these people know who they are, what they are. And this is who they are. They're mine. They're created in my image. They're created after my likeness. And so we need to start there. That's the first mention. But it doesn't take long for identity crisis and our, our, our identity to be stolen. It doesn't take long. In fact, we're going to go jump to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent is in the garden and he's talking to Eve in this tree. And if you know the story we've talked about for the last few weeks, he's tempting Eve to eat this fruit that God said don't. God said you can do anything, you can eat anything, just don't do this and here's the serpent with the forbidden fruit saying, won't you eat this? But let's look what he says. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Wait, hold up. Genesis chapter 1, let's go back. Then God said, let us make man in our image. We are already like God. We're already created with an identity. We're already created with a purpose, with a calling, with a belonging, with, with, with a, 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 a place that we could call our own. We've already been given an identity, yet in just a few chapters later, all of a sudden the enemy comes in. And what is he doing? He's perverting, he's manipulating, he's causing confusion in what? Eve's identity. Who are you? Don't you want to be like God? You know what she should have said? Shut up. I am like God. I walked with him this morning in the garden. That's what the scripture tells us, that Adam and Eve walked with him in the cool of the day. They were walking around, hanging out. They knew God. They'd seen God. They experienced his love. They'd experienced his relationship. They knew their creator more intimately than we've ever been able to. I mean, they walked with God, yet here's the serpent in his deception, in his lies. Don't you want to be like him? She says, I know I'm like him. I was with him. He told me. He made me. Yet, all of a sudden, this lie, this seed, this deception gets into her heart. And this is what we see. The serpent <clears throat> caused the very first identity crisis. So we can see in Genesis 1, our identity is clear. But then Genesis 3, our identity is corrupted. And, and this is something that, that you need to know, is that any identity crisis that you may have, the questions you may ask about yourself, who am I? What, what am I? Why did God make me this way? Why did this happen in my life? All of those questions can be answered back to this. Any lies, deception, any negativity, where does it come from? The enemy, the serpent, the devil. Any truth, any foundation, any alignment with our true identity, where does that come from? Go back one more chapter. Go back to Genesis 1. You're made in the image of God. So we can see this law of first mention, these two things. And the enemy here is speaking and inserting a false narrative, a lie. And this is what he's saying to Eve. He's telling her, you have a lack of worth and you need to strive to be something more. Don't you want to be like God? Because you're not yet. Yes, she was. She was made in the image of God. That's a lie. It's a deception. A seed planted in her. And all of a sudden she's going, oh, well, maybe, maybe I do need to, well, maybe I, I, I do need to do more. Maybe God does want more of me. Maybe I am missing out on something. Maybe walking with God isn't enough. Maybe there's this forbidden fruit or these other things that I can buy into and I can lean into. And maybe those things will give me fulfillment. Maybe I need God plus. 
Yes, I walk with God, but what else am I missing? And the enemy tricks her into thinking there's something else out there. There's another piece of your identity out there. You just need to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. This is a deception that's been, and it started in, in, the, in the garden with Eve messing with her identity. And it's the same thing the devil's doing today. He's looking at you and going, God plus. Yes, you need to have a relationship with God, but what else out there is going to make you feel fulfilled? What are you missing in your identity? Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it an achievement? Is it a words of affirmation from someone? What else are we missing in our identity that's going to make us feel like God? Yet, we know we're made in the very image of God. And so the enemy is manipulating. He's lying. And these are the type of things he says. The enemy says this, you aren't good enough. You aren't lovable. You need to lose weight. You need to make better grades. In fact, it doesn't even matter what you do. You can try. It doesn't matter. It won't be enough. You won't be accepted here. This church won't love you. There's not a small group for you. There's no friends for you. Your marriage isn't going to make it. No one wants to hire you. There's no hope. There's no help. These are the lies of the enemy. He comes in to plant these seeds. And, and this is what I want you to know today. And I want you to tell your neighbor this right now. The devil is a liar. Turn to your neighbor right now. Tell him. The devil is a liar. Now turn to your other neighbor. For whatever reason, you chose them second. And tell them, say, the devil is a liar. This is what he is. He's been doing the same thing over and over again, lying to us. He's been manipulating us, deceiving us. Eve knew she was made in the image of God, but he planted a seed of doubt. You're not quite there yet. There's something else you need to do. You need to earn it. You need to work it. There's something else that you can have. And here's something you need to realize this morning is that you cannot remove your worth from God. You can't take it away. God chooses that you have value and there's nothing you can do to change his mind. Enemy knows that. He knows he can't change God. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he says, I love you, I created you, you're made in my image, the enemy can't change it. He knows it, so he doesn't attack that. What he attacks is you. He attacks your perspective. Does God really love me? Do I really have worth? He can't change God, so he tries to change you. And so what does he do? He attacks your identity. You're not worthy. You're not lovable. Well, you've got to fix this. You've got you to correct this. And so he starts attacking your identity because he can't change God. And when he tried to up in the heavens, he got kicked out. didn't work so good for him. And so what does he do? He's trying to mess with us. He can manipulate us, change us, make us wonder if we're worthy. Make us wonder if we're lovable. Make us wonder if, if God would really gave his son for us or just for them. And here's what I want you to know before we go any further is that God does love you. God loves you. He's chosen you. He has a place for you. He loves you right now. He's not waiting for a better version of you. But what the enemy can do is cause you to believe you don't have any worth. And he, this is what he wants you to think. He wants you to think you need to earn God's love. You need God plus. Yes, you're walking with God, but what about this apple? Yes, you're walking with God, but what about that job? What about that career? What about that achievement? What about that scholarship? What about that boyfriend? What about that girlfriend? What, what about that relationship? What about that marriage? What, if you can get that, then you will feel fulfilled. And this has been a line of deception of the enemy since the beginning. It's God plus. And this is what we need to know. We can't achieve the love of God, you can only receive it. And this is like one of the most profound things for me to try to work through as an individual is that I can't achieve it, but I can receive it. God has given it and he wants to give it. I'll show you this, a couple of scriptures, Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, meaning we haven't done anything, Nothing good. We haven't achieved anything. We haven't proven anything. We haven't served. We haven't tithed. We didn't do egg the park. We haven't done any of that stuff yet. We haven't repented. We didn't read our Bible. We didn't get our highlighter out. We didn't start our reading plans. We haven't fasted yet. None of that before we did anything in response to God's love, he already chose to love us. And this is a profound, profound statement for us. We can't earn it. It's given. And this is why I think for some of us, though, it, it can become difficult for us to believe this. It's, this it sounds easy, but it's very difficult to believe that God would love us without us having to do anything in response. And the enemy starts with partial truths. He's smart. He starts with things that you can agree with and are true. 
So the enemy might say something to you like this. You're not good enough. And then you go and you step into your bathroom and you look in the mirror and you go, I'm not good enough. That's true. I'm not. I I remember on that baseball team, I'm not good enough to be on the all-star team. That was true. It wasn't a false thing. It wasn't a mean thing. No one yelled at me. No one made fun of me. It was just true. I'm not good enough. I'm I'm not that guy. And then the enemy would tell you this, you'll never be good enough. And you can go look in the mirror and you go, you know what? I can work really hard. I don't know I'm ever going to be 6'9". <laughs> I can stretch, I can run, I can jump, but there's a certain part of me genetically that's not going to make it into the NBA. <laughs> so I can look in the mirror and go, I will never be good enough. I'm never going to be able to do some of these things. Some of the things that I think would be awesome, some of the things, I'll never be able to take that vacation, never be able to have that job, never be able to, like some of these things I might not ever achieve. They may not be for me. It may not be in my lot in life. It may not be in my, the, the, the path that I'm in. And so the enemy gives us these partial truths. You're not good enough and you won't ever be good enough. We look in the mirror and we go, that's true. But then he stops right there. And that's the problem with a lot of us. We stop right there. Not good enough, I'll never be good enough. And we don't get to the cross. Because the reason the cross exists is because those things are true. You're not good enough. You won't be good enough. And so God sent his son to go to the cross, to die because those things were true. I'm not here to tell you you're good enough. I'm not here to pat you on the back today. You're a sinner. You're broken. We all have failures. We got identity issues. Every one of us in a room do. And so you're like, man, that's not really encouraging. It should be when you can look at the cross and go, it doesn't matter how hard I work. It doesn't matter what I can achieve. God loved me anyways. He loved me so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to take on my sins. I love how First John puts this. This is love. You want to know what love is? This is it. Not that we have loved God. We can't, we can't do enough. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. What does that mean? To take the place of, to be the ransom for our sins. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Not that we can do enough to earn it, but he knows we can't. He knows we aren't good enough. And so he says, you know what? I still love you. And I know you're not going to be able to achieve the things I hope you would achieve. You messed it up in the garden. You know what? Don't blame Adam and Eve. If you were there, you'd screw it up too. And so we look back and we say, this is who we are. I'm not good enough. He says, I got a plan. I'm sending my son. He's going to take on the cross. He's going to pay the price for your sin. And what does that do? It washes us. It redeems us. I love the word redeem. It's such a beautiful word. To take something that has no value and to give it value. To take something that is broken and thrown away and say, no, this is, has a ton of value. This is, this, is, this is what God does. You may not feel worthy. In fact, you might not actually be worthy. But because of Jesus, you are. You may not be lovable. You may be a hard person to love. That might be true. But because of Jesus, you are loved. And, and this is what God does for us. And so this is a, a point I want you to kind of hang your hat on this morning. You are loved. God showed us that when he sent Jesus to the cross. There's a judge in the Old Testament. His name is Samson. Probably heard of him. If you've been in church any length of time, probably heard stories about this long-haired, buff dude, much like myself, just a little longer hair. He had a beard. He took the Nazarite vow. He didn't drink alcohol. I mean, I adhere to all those things. I just need to grow my hair out, and I I could play Samson at our next Bible, uh, you know, presentation. Um, But... He took the Nazarite vow, and, and, and his parents submitted him and, and consecrated him and said, hey, he's got a purpose. And so they, they had him do these things, not cut his hair, not drink alcohol, not, not cut his beard, to be holy, to be set apart, to serve the Lord. And God had a great purpose on his life. In fact, God supernaturally gave him strength. I'm not talking about like he could do a couple push-ups or bench press. Was it at the, at the NFL Combine, 225? Yeah, it's not 225 50 times. It's not 225 100 times. He just takes the bar and snaps it. That's what this dude Samson would do. It says that he went to a, a gates of an enemy, and they were all in there, and they, were, they had been causing problems. And so what does Samson do? He rips the gates off of the wall. He goes and rips the gate. I'm not talking about the gate to your backyard. I'm talking about to a fortress. And he carries them on his back down to town. He's like, look what I did. And a lion comes to attack him. And what does he do? He takes the lion, puts his hands in his mouth, and rips the lion in half with his bare hands. This is Samson. Read it. You think the Bible's boring? I'm telling you, get in the Old Testament. There's some crazy stuff in there. <laughs> but he had an identity in his strength. He was strong. Everyone knew he was strong. He was feared. 
He walked, one time picked up a, a donkey jawbone and killed 100 Philistines, just whacked them with a, an old bone, a fossil. Just not a sword, uh, not a gun, with a bone. I mean, that, that just, that's like showing off. It's like, yeah, I know I could use a sword, but what else is around here? You know, that's too easy. You know, and so he's just like this man's man, and he was set apart. God gave him that gifting for a purpose, to be a deliverer for God's people. But we're going to see right here in Judges chapter 14, he had some identity problems. It says, then he came up, Samson did, and told his father and mother, I saw this beautiful girl, one of the Philistines, and now go get her for me as my wife. Well, as being a Nazarite, he took a vow to only marry inside of his own people group, inside the Israelites, God's chosen people. And he says, no, I want one of these. I want the forbidden fruit. I want God plus. And so he asked for this, and then he goes on, he says, but his father and mother said to him, is there not another woman? They know the vows, they know the consecration, they know the calling, they know his identity, what God has given him to do. Is there not another woman inside these people groups? There's not someone here. This is what you're supposed to do, Samson. And this is what he says, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Here he is allowing the world and all of her offerings to say, is God not enough? You've been given a calling. You've been given a purpose. There's even a people group that you can find a wife in. Probably some pretty girls in, the, in, in, in there. But no, he wants what was forbidden. He wants, and this is what the enemy is doing, pulling us away from God, pulling us away from our identity, calling us out to these other things, to the worldly things, to these fleshly things. They look good. They might taste good. They might smell good. But they're outside of the identity and the calling that God has for us. And this is what the enemy wants for you. You know what Samson ends up doing? He follows his lustful passions. He ends up having multiple uh, affairs and relationships with different women. And it ends up getting him killed, literally. Gets his eyes gorged out, his hair cut, he loses his strength, and he ends up dying. He doesn't really even die a hero, even though he takes a bunch of Philistines out with him. He dies a tragic, tragic hero. And this is what the enemy wants for you. The enemy wants to steal your marriage. He wants to steal your future. He wants to steal your business. He wants to steal your potential. He wants to, to steal your, your friendships. He wants to kill your life. He wants to kill you literally. He wants to hurt you. He wants to hurt your kids. He wants to destroy everything about you. But he knows that you're chosen and you're set apart. He knows that God loves you and there's nothing that you can do to, to, to disearn God's love. And so what does he do? He attacks your identity. God is good. He's even okay with you guys going to church. He's okay with you being here today. He's just, God is good, but what, what else? God is good, but I also need alcohol. God is good, but I also need my career. God is good, but my kids, they're going to be superstars. And so I got to, man, they're going to go to the NBA someday, John. And so that's why we're doing all these basketball camps. God is good. And so what we do is we start doing a God plus to things. And then what ends up happening, if we're not careful, and this happens to lots of people, is that God ends up becoming the elective. You know when you're in high school and you, your, your counselor says, what classes do you want? And you're like... Man, I don't know. I'll take what I have to take English, science, math. Okay, I'll do all those. And like, you have to take two more. And like, can I just leave early? No, you have to take two more. And you're like, uh, can I take robotics? Yeah, how easy is that? Uh, it's, it's the teacher is a football coach. Yes, I want to take robotics. <laughs> Anytime you got a coach teaching a class, take that class. I'm telling you, easy A. Um, you know, and so like, but that's how we can sometimes treat God. I've got my life, got my career, got my kids, got my marriage, got got these things I'm achieving, and I've got all these things that I'm pursuing, but God is the plus. He's the what I have time for on the outside. He he becomes the and then and then all of a sudden we wonder why our identity can't handle the weight. And here's what happened with Samson. His identity was strength, power, but that couldn't hold the weight of what God had called him to do. He thought, I'm strong enough to rip the doors off. I'm strong enough to rip a line in half. I'm strong enough to defeat 100 Philistines. I can take on anything, but he couldn't. His identity had a crisis, and it crushed him. And we can do the same thing, too. We we allow our identities. We think, my career can hold my life. My kids can hold my life. My marriage can hold my life. And we're putting an unfair weight on people and unfair weight on things that cannot be sustained. And this is what happens. Our identity crumbles. When it rests on the shoulders of ourselves, our giftedness, the things that we, when it rests on the shoulders of others. Some of you in the room, you're like, once I get married, everything's going to get work out. I just need to find that special someone. That's an unfair weight on that next person you're going to date. 
We think, we think okay, once I get married, some of you are like, I'm, I'm addicted to pornography, but once I get married and I can have sex when I want, then I'll quit doing that. That's an unfair weight on that person. You've got some things. You've got some identity crisis. You've got some things, some sin that needs to be dealt with. It's unfair to assume that spouse is going to fix something for you. Some of you think if I just get that promotion and I can make $20,000 more a year, then we can change houses and we can, we can go on that vacation and then our family will kind of gel. And that's an unfair way on that promotion. It's an unfair way on, on, on the, the money to think that those things can carry our calling, to think that those things can carry our identity. And when we place the weight of our identity on ourselves, on others, and things, the weight of it eventually crumbles. What happened to Samson? I'm strong enough. No, he wasn't. He wasn't strong enough to say no to his lustful passions. He wasn't strong enough to say no to his desires. And he ended up getting swayed by the world and then crushed by the weight of it. So the big question for us is, not who am I? The big question for us today, the weight of our identity is this, whose am I? If I can't carry the weight, if you can't carry the weight, if my job can't carry the weight, if my, that d- degree that I'm trying to get, if it can't carry the weight, who can carry the weight? I can't, but he can. And why can he? Because whoever designed you and created you and chose you and called you is the one who gets to define you and give you purpose and calling. What you've been looking for in the world, I'm telling you, will only be found in one place. It's not a God plus, it's a God only. And when you recognize none of these things are good enough, only God is. None of these things will work, only God is. Until you get to that place, you're not going to find the strength and the purpose in your own calling. And, and, and this is a unique thing about humanity. Is we're actually wired to receive our calling or identity verbally. This is why the things that people say to us matter and make a difference. This is why some of you in your room, your identity is broken. You, you, it's been stolen from you because people have said things that have hurt you. They've called you names. They've ridiculed you. They've said things about, behind you, about you behind your back. And the weight of those things have crushed you because we're actually wired to receive part of our identity verbally. We're, we're, we're wired that way. And we esteem to receive esteem from others. Like we are, our affirmation ourselves are built up when others say nice things to us. And so we're kind of wired that way. And this is why so many of us are hung up on what our parents called us or what our coach said to us or what our friends said to us. And this is why so many young adults today, teenagers, college students, I'm talking to you guys today. This is why so many of you are struggling with your identity is because we're looking to be affirmed verbally from someone else. We're wired that way. And you're thinking, well, why did God wire us that way? Because he wired us that way because he thought he was going to walk with us in the garden. He thought his voice would shape us. He thought his words would shape us. He, his plan is for his voice to give you your identity. The problem is our voices, the voices we hear are not his. In fact, we've cut God out. We've cut God out of our schools. We've cut God out of our families. We've cut God out of, out of, out of our churches. We've cut God, I mean, our, uh, so many things that we just do it the way that we want to do it. It's our preference. It's our likings. And we've cut God out. We push God out. And then we wonder why our identity is so, so all over the place. Why do I never feel confident? Why am I always in this kind of lost? Why am I always seeking the approval of my boss? Why do I always need someone else? And, and, and teenagers, I want to speak to you guys. Young adults, I want to speak to you guys today. The world and the enemy is smart. He knows when your identity is is unstable. He knows that when you're a teenager and you're kind of coming out from underneath your parents' identity, what they've been saying about you and and what they've been calling you to and the standard and you're stepping into your own, he knows you're in a fragile place. So now I, I, I know my parents have said this. I know they said that they love me. I know they maybe even said, maybe they're great parents that said God loves you and they've taught me some things. But what what's really out there? It happens in high school and first couple of years of college. And they get out there and what do they hear? They don't hear the voice of God. They hear the voice of their friends. They hear the voice of the enemy. And the enemy loves to find someone who's lost their identity, who can't remember that they were made in God's image. Because this is what he starts to say. And I'm going to be very blunt with you. There's been people who, who, I, who I know and who I've heard, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying they, they don't know their identity. And they're like, man, I, I'm, I'm in college and I'm not really sure my identity, like I've tried to date girls, and it's, I'm talking about a dude here, and I've tried to date girls, and it's not worked out for me. I've been turned down every time. And then someone says, well, maybe you're not supposed to date girls. Maybe you're supposed to date guys. 
They plant a little seed, a, a voice in your life that starts to speak an affirmation, starts to give you an esteem in a certain direction that starts to change your identity, starts to manipulate your identity. And all of a sudden, and that can happen from a kid. It can also happen to us when we're adults. And all of a sudden, we start to find our identity in the voices of others, in the voices even of the enemy. When I'm telling you right here, God's voice, since the beginning, we got to go back to the first mention. This is what God says. You're made in my image. Male and female, I've made you. I've loved you. I've chosen you. You're a royal priesthood. Not because of anything that you've done, but because I love you and I've chosen you. And this is how good our God is. And this is what we must do. We must find our identity in Christ. There's no other name in the heavens that will be saved. And so if our salvation comes from Christ alone, if we were created in his image, wouldn't it make sense to go back to the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who gave his life for us, the one who says you're worthy even when you don't, when you, I, you don't do what I want you to do. You're worthy and I love you even when you walk away from me. You're worthy, <coughs> excuse me, and I love you even when you make mistakes, even when you've never chosen me, even when you've done all the wrong things. I still love you and I still gave my life for you on the cross. Wouldn't we want to go to that person to get our identity? Not the one whose love is conditional. Not the one who just wants to say what's popular or what's true. Or not the one who maybe just wants to stay with their own opinion or use their own hurts to spew on you. Let's go to Jesus who went to the cross, who says, I love you even when you didn't love me. That's the person we want to get our identity from. That's the person we want to say, God, who am I? And the question is not who am I, it's whose am I? And I am yours. I am loved. I am chosen. I love how C.S. Lewis says this. He says, your real new self will not come as long as you're looking for it. If you're looking for your identity, you won't find it. It will come when you start looking for him. You want to know who you are, what your purpose is, what your identity is. Allow his voice to speak to you. I'm telling you, some of you, your identity will be affirmed and confirmed in you by just showing up to church, letting the Word of God be preached to you, by opening up your Bible at home and starting a, a version reading program, or uh, what's the one all the, my wife's doing, Bible Recap. And, and I'm telling you, if you want to get a, a confident sense of your identity, you need to allow the voice of God to speak in your life. One last verse here, and I'll close this up. John 1, 12. Remember, I told you, you can't achieve His love. You can only receive it. Remember that? But to all who did receive him. That's all you have to do. Just receive him today. For all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You have a place. You have an identity. You're loved. You're chosen. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You've been set apart. You're the head. You're not the tail. This is the future God has for you. If he created you, he gets to purpose you. And God has an identity. And here it is. If you just receive it and believe it, this is who you are. You're a son and daughter of the Most High.